we have gone live. Great. So, hello everyone. Welcome to the third panel discussion of Green Hope Foundation's virtual SDG Summit. My name is Gehkesha. I am the founder president of global social innovation enterprise Green Hope Foundation, and I will be the moderator for today's panel. We are so excited to have our panelists here today. So a huge welcome to our wonderful panelists, our audience on Zoom and on Facebook Live. So we all know that the human impact of the ongoing pandemic has been more devastating than anything we have experienced in living memory. But what we have seen repeated is the disproportionate and debilitating impact of previous disasters that have had on vulnerable populations, on young people, on women and girls, especially in rural areas and developing nations, on the old and the infirm, on economically challenged sections, on indigenous people. So the question is, isn't it time to address these fundamental inequalities that beset our social systems? How can we ensure that we provide equitable access to the fundamental pillars of growth, that's access to education, healthcare, housing, employment, social justice. So we are delighted to have with us today an eminent panel of multidisciplinary experts who will share their perspectives on how the recovery process builds a more humane social system that is also resilient and equitable, thereby achieving the sustainable development goals and Agenda 2030. So on that note, it is my great honor to invite our first speaker, Her Excellency Lillian Ferrier, Minister of Education, Science and Culture of the Republic of Suriname. Your Excellency, you have the floor. Thank you. Greetings from Suriname, dear uh, panelists and everybody who is following all over the world. I am uh, Dr. Lillian Ferrier, I'm a psychologist, but presently the Minister of Education, Science and Culture in Suriname. Suriname is maybe unknown. It is a republic in the north of South America. It's part of the Guyana Shield and the greenest country in the world. That's how we met, isn't it? <laughs> um, the importance is the high forest and low deforestation. Um, we have a 93% territory covered with forest. Moreover, we have fresh water basins, oil, gas, gold, Form, uh, they form a, a guarantee for a prosperous economy, but the population and the administration finding uh, about 45 years being a republic, our own way to find a direction for development, that's another uh, history. Um, we have a low population density, even 700,000 people, a, a territory of 164,000 square kilometers. So there are huge differences on the resort where you live. We have the indigenous populations, they live in their villages, most in the southern districts but of course everything um, we offer there has an uh, impact in how the population deals with it and that also goes for education we are multi-ethnic multi-religious multilinguistics we speak over 20 languages and there is great diversity both culturally and with regard to the biodiversity. And most important, we have a very promising young generation with lots of talent. 
And then in March this year, we were confronted with the pandemic of COVID-19. Our first active uh, case was diagnosed mid-March 2020. Minister Ferrier, we are unable to hear you. Your video screen is frozen. It seems we're having a bit of technical difficulty. I will just look into that. Am I back again? Sorry. You're back. We have a very unstable internet connection. Sorry for that. Okay, I started with um, the pandemic uh, was exposed mid-March and the immediate actions we have lockdown of our airport and the schools. It was two weeks prior to the Eastern holiday, so we just closed the schools immediately. And for two months, the COVID crisis management team was able to keep the status very low. We had then only nine positive cases and one death. And that stayed to stayed like that until the end of May. Then we have open borders. And as I explained, Suriname is part of the Guyana. Even if the rivers form the borders, families are tied together and they live, some live across the river. It's another country, it's French Guyana or this Guyana, but they're still family. So the crossing, uh, went on, sometimes illegally, and in both our neighbor countries, and also that goes also for Brazil in the south, people can cross the borders very easily. Another important factor was the elections. We considered of postponing the government the choice to have the elections at the end of May, the 25th of May, but that even uh, brought more people at risk. And then we have the problem of the illegal and also legal immigrants moving in. And that these last two weeks, the effect of the virus very imminent. Presently, we have eight deaths and over 217 positive cases and over 300 people in quarantine. And the situation changes from day to day. Again, this situation going on, the whole education system was thrown into uncertainty. How to deal? Again, we locked down all the schools with uh, the Eastern holidays, teachers who are in the southern districts, they come to visit in the capital, in Paramaribo. And also the children that we have here in, in school, they visit their family in the villages. So there was a lot of movement of both teachers, school leaders, and students all over the uh, different villages. Then we started with um, the distant education. First, we planned. There was a crisis evening action plan developed, and we introduced stream 
uh, on television. I will explain stream uh, mostly new as uh, STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math. We in Suriname added the R for both reading. In some of our neighbor Caribbean countries, they have the R for reading. Um, and the A stands for arts because Suriname, as I said, young, talented people. So arts and expression, artist, artistic expression is for. We introduced these two lessons and we're still uh, engaged in that on television. We all started to re the, the revision of the curricula. Um, upgrading the curricula according to the integrated, uh, I will explain that later. And then we had to do a lot with data, data not only of about the capacities of the teachers, especially with, with regard to um, e-learning and very low, so with regard to ICT, we have to develop training for the teachers. Um, the outreach, the children and can even uh, receive the television uh, broadcasting. We had a lot of international assistance from IDB, CEF, OAS, UNESCO, and that uh, made us possible for us to move forward. Um, I, I really, this change of vision and of, of ideas is for us as a, a young uh, developed uh, nation, it's very important to change, exchange these ideas. The challenge regard to where do we go now. Um, we follow the SDG roadmap, of course. I went to Cochabamba two years ago from UNESCO, but we also fo follow the COSA um, from the CARICOM the Human Resource Development Strategy 2030 strategy and and as Caribbean countries, we're very close together to follow up the results and be on that. Um, so access and participant is one of the key uh, elements we are uh, following so that we leave no but for the students, again, in different districts of Suriname, access and participation is not um, naturally. So we have to invent other ways. We started the project now with tablets to prepare the lesson on tablets and to train the teacher to work with the children on the tablets. Because we can reach the children in several districts. Equity is another uh, factor we follow. And equity, not only with regard to gender, but with regard to the location. And then, of course, the quality of education uh, our education system was decades behind, nothing being adapted to the 21st century. And so we have a high percentage of dropouts because children are just not, especially boys, are not interested anymore in the education system as how it is presented. That goes also for the little ones, the preschoolers, uh, they preschoolers uh, on a table for the whole day. And then again, the, the relevance of 
the curricula. We change, we change the areas of learning, more stressing the social emotional learning. We have different uh, teams, health and well-being, economy, science and technology, and then human rights, it's especially uh, the rights of the children, the rights of the children and people, uh, the disabled people. Again, I'm, I'm one of the persons who is always busy with um, the Convention on the Rights of Children. And it's important that the children are aware of their rights. What we want to do is to make strong Suriname citizens. We have to build them. They, we want children that are proud of country. And that's why there's a need to the system. Uh, the lessons are now being prepared in an integrated and child-centered approach. We use, again, we use the restreaming. Right, yeah. I will show you. Happy? Oh. I wanted to show you a picture of the B streaming, but. Sure, you can share your screen. It's over here. here. Yeah. Yeah, can you see it? Yes. Then you see the. The students with their uniform, but how they are engaged in learning. And this goes especially for the boys. You see, also we have the culture, the sessions, lessons. There we have lessons in uh, frac uh, fractions, we have lessons in um, nature dealing with nature but also with the technology how to build your drone things like that and children love this and we started with at the fifth grade of the primary so this is new for Suriname we also uh, present this via the television we hope to be able to continue this coach the next one the team uh, the team, I'll give you an example. One of the sub teams is this is me. We develop awareness, relationship, culture, we are very important again because with so many, um, we, we come from all parts of the world, our ancestors. So living together as one big, big family. It's very important. I think Suriname, we have, we're famous for our nature, but we should also be famous for our human behavior, peaceful, living together, uh, respecting each other, religions and other people. We celebrate the national holidays. We celebrate Diwali, but we also celebrate the abolition of the, the slavery. Things like that, as one. So, money, very important. Children need to know about economy because Suriname, again, is a very rich country. But how do you make money? How do you become an entrepreneur? Uh, what is money? What is the value of money? Then, again, ICT and data, that's priority now, leaping forward, and that's thanks to COVID. Um, environment, okay? You, you've been here, you saw our nature, but, and it is, it's pure. And we want pure. So, 
children need to not are uh, over changes also the changes we now dealing with flooding also in the south that means your whole agriculture what they plant is gone and we have to provide um, food in the south and personal health and well-being healthy lifestyles again not as a separate subject but it is integrated in the whole curricula dealing now with COVID, all these aspects and of course human children rights and your citizen and what is expected what are your responsibilities and again uh what are your rights the right to speak up the right to explore the right to profit from what the country is producing not only the people at the top but the, this is these are the changes for now. Then your question to the last deck of the is what we want now to um, what we want is to continue and even accelerate this reform in the education process again. Uh, according to the HRD 2030 strategy from CARICOM COSEP. We want to continue the B-streaming as a way to teach. Uh, we want the curricula to be relevant for Suriname as part of South America, eh? children and the Caribbean. We want the curricula also more adjusted to the needs of the labor market. Recently, beginning of this year, the oil business now is very interesting for all investors over the world. But if I look at the education system, where are children taught even the slightest things about oil and engineering and things like that? It's maybe past university and only two percent of our children reach that level so uh, the Suriname National Training Authority becomes very important and a whole of technical and scientific education I'm, I'm finishing <laughs> so for now um, we're in a stage of transition not only because of the pandemic but also because we just have the elections and we will have a change of the administration, the national administration. So I won't be a minister for long anymore, but for us it is important that there's a continu continuity of the, this way we are dealing now and that we're not going back just looking only at our former colonizer, because that is now, uh, everything becomes now the Netherlands. No, we are integrated with South Americans and we're integrated here also in the Caribbean region. And we, we set out this line. So that is one of the important things. Lessons learned, I see this whole pandemic for us in Suriname as an opportunity. An opportunity to know your country better, to know what is lacking, as you stated, where, with regard to health, with regard to uh, infrastructure, with regard to distribution of the goods we, we all have. And then you see which vulnerable groups are there and where are they and what are their needs. We, we were forced to look and focus on that. Um, so, our job now is to report on the lessons learned. Um, again, we have to deal with border conflicts. It's very difficult, again, because of the family relation. We have to deal with the illegal immigrants there because there's a lot of gold and there are a lot of, uh, yeah, Brazilians coming over for gold miners but now also we have people from venezuela and cuba coming in um 
we have to deal with climate change. At this moment, we have a flooding situation and uh, our, our crisis management team has to engage both with COVID and with the, the flooding, which is not easy. And of course, our financial position, that's the budget. So we are continue our way to achieving the SDG goals for Suriname. Let them on this mind. Okay, let it, let it, let it. Huh? Yeah, this is what we're going for. In the integrated way, we, we set the basics, we set the fundamentals, and we will get there. If we don't know the way or the new uh, uh, government, God will make the way to get us there. But thank you. That's my presentation. Thank you so much, Your Excellency. Thank you for sharing how you have adapted uh, and uh, transitioned the education system to stream education. I think that's so amazing, very inclusive of all. Uh, how uh, basically new ideas of accessibility and training teachers uh, as well. And uh, I, at Green Hope Foundation, it's, uh, Suriname is like a second home for us. And Suriname is really a model nation for living and growing together in harmony with people and nature. And I'm sure you will be able to achieve the Sustainable uh, Development Goals. So thank you once again. I would now like to invite our next speaker, Ms. Astra Bonini, Senior Sustainable Development Officer, Integrated Policy and Analysis Branch, Division for SDGs at the United Nations Department of Economic and Social Affairs. Ms. Astra, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Hekashan, and thanks to the Green Hope Foundation for organizing this opportunity to discuss um, the impacts of COVID-19 on the SDGs. And it's a, a, an honor to be part of this esteemed panel um, with Her Excellency Minister Ferrier and, and other colleagues. Um, I'll try to just speak a little bit about some of the work we're doing here at um, the United Nations Department of Economic and Social Affairs. We have a, started a um, policy brief series that looks at a lot of the issues that are um, important in the context of responding to COVID-19 and building back in a better way. And um, there was a one colleague who mentioned it's it's not that we want to build back necessarily, but we want to build into a, a fundamentally transformed way of, of living and, and interacting with nature. So um, this is is one of the the challenges that we face. Um, I'm going to just go over three main points of some of the work we've been doing. One is how pre-pandemic process or progress on the SDGs has really shaped the severity of some of the impacts of COVID-19. Um, and then there are the challenges of identifying exactly what the channels are through which COVID-19 is affecting the SDGs so that we know how to respond. And then um, there's the question of how can we use the crisis to really build back in a new way and move away from a business as usual approach to the SDGs and towards something that um, really balances um, the needs of human well being and the natural environment and um, speaks to this new context that we're experiencing with COVID 19. Um, so I'm just going to share my screen and, and show a couple of slides that try to condense some of this into a um, manageable way. So we, we first have um, this question of what was the what were the trends and progress on the SDGs before the crisis hit? And how is this um, shaping the severity of some of the impacts that we see? And there are you know, several 
all of the SDGs make a difference, but there are several that really um, stand out. One is SDG three, um, good health and well-being. Um, we know that there are cases where there's uh, a lack of healthcare workers and um, health systems are very strained at this moment as they absorb the rise in cases of COVID and um, the need for healthcare. And also the um, air pollution that was existing already and some of the non-communicable diseases that are making certain parts of the population more susceptible to severe cases. Um, so this, this is one area where the, the progress has, has left um, some groups in particular vulnerable, where we're seeing some of the inequalities coming out in the severity of, of cases and in the exposure to um, COVID. SDG 6, clean water and sanitation. Um, one in four healthcare facilities still lack uh, basic water services. So when we talk about hand washing and some of the basic methods of reducing um, the likelihood of, of infection, it becomes very difficult. Also, three billion people lack soap and water at home. So this is a very challenging situation. Um, the, the minister brought up the access to internet for education, and it's wonderful to hear that they've moved so quickly toward enabling students to use tablets and, and access remote learning. Um, but we know that some, you know, 46% of people don't have access to broadband internet. So this is an, a situation unexpectedly where many students have moved to remote learning and that's not possible for a large part of the population. Um, SDG 11 on sustainable cities and communities. There are, are 1 billion people who live in, in slums that are crowded with, with no running water and um, it becomes very difficult to social distance. And then SDG 15, life on land, um, the trade and in, in, um, the, the illegal trade in, in animals is um, something that has come up very prevalently in increasing risk to outbreaks of, of zoonotic diseases like COVID-19. So this is another area that um, more progress needs to be happening much more quickly to build resilience against uh, public health threat like COVID-19. Um, moving forward, we have certain impact channels to identify so that we can see how do we respond both in the immediate term in the emergency responses and then in the longer term of really building back in a way that it, um, accelerates progress toward 2030. And there's the virus itself that um, is having unequal effects really in terms of exposure. People who work in certain sectors or live in certain conditions are more exposed than others. Um, and then healthcare systems are strained to, to manage this. Um, and then the control measures that are put in place, so, so, uh, travel restrictions and social distancing, um, these have different impacts on those who are able to telecommute or work from home, um, the informal economy and service sectors that are not able to um, find alternative means of, of earning an income and, and sustaining their livelihoods. And then the aggregate effects of both of these where there are projections for an economic recession, um, fiscal space may be more constrained for some countries as commodity prices drop and, and trade restrictions are in place. Um, but then we see emissions falling. Uh, so, so this gives a glimpse of what might be possible if we really work to transform um, our approach to economies and, and to um, consumption and production. Again, there are, are it's, it's a bit early to say with certainty what the impacts are going to be on the SDGs, but there are forecasts and projections coming out. Um, this is just a sample of some of the projections on how the impacts might unfold on certain SDGs. Um, SDG 1, poverty, it's, it's very concerning. There are estimates that um, 35 to 60 million people could be pushed back into poverty. Uh, that would be one of the first increases in global poverty in more than 20 years. So it, it really would be a significant setback toward um, enabling all people to live a, a good and healthy life. Um, 
there are estimates that hunger could increase. Um, it was already you know, discussed in detail, the impact on children and on education systems. And gender equality, women make up 70% of the healthcare workforce, so they're more exposed, and they also do a bulk of the unpaid care work and are at greater risk of domestic violence. So there are some, some very large implications for gender equality with the crisis. And then decent work and economic growth. These aggregate effects are really pushing um, the, the workers who depend on the informal economy, the gig economy, and um, small businesses are, are struggling to maintain their incomes. On the other hand, SDG 13, moving toward the, the Paris Agreement and meeting um, climate goals, this is a moment where there is a drop in the emissions, but we have to understand that it's temporary if we move back to approaches to production and consumption that are, are based on a business as usual model. So it's something to, um, we have a pause to reflect, but it's going to require a significant change to, to make a difference in the long run. Just quickly to point to three areas that um, we're seeing really could uh, mitigate the impacts and lead toward an approach that builds back in a better way to the future. One is to focus on eradicating extreme deprivations. The potential rise in poverty is extremely concerning and um, attention to ensuring that um, vulnerable populations especially have access to basic services, um, you know, emergency food availability, uh, shelter, um, replacing lost incomes in the, the near term, but also providing services that are able to reach some of the vulnerable populations and reducing any of the barriers that they may face will be very important, whether they're legal or social norms. Um, and then providing universal, universal quality essential services. And this includes some of the services that are needed to um, eradicate poverty, but also thinking about some of the areas that have become very visible during the crisis, like access to the internet, um, uh, access to quality health care, and making sure that universal essential services um, encompass some of these areas. Social protection is very critical right now for those who are out of work and, and without livelihoods. And finally, building back sustainably in a way that reduces pressure on the environment. Um, we're seeing glimpses of reductions in air pollution and in um, greenhouse gas emissions at the moment. But this really has to be scaled up even more and continued through 2030 to allow us to meet our goals. Um, and, and these are areas that will require interventions, whether promoting green jobs that enables people to have livelihoods and to um, shift the infrastructure to low carbon um, infrastructures or to um, use the space right now where fossil fuel prices are low and um, there's maybe more social awareness of environmental needs to introduce new legislation that, that um, helps push toward environmental sustainability. And I'll just stop there. Um, I'm happy to, to participate in the Q&A later. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Astra, and thank you for explaining how the pre-pandemic uh, trends affect the current trends, uh, including how lack of action on SDG 15 can promote zoonosis. And you also uh, emphasized uh, like how the positive environmental impact that we can see now is uh, temporary and how it's important that when we build back better, we ensure economic stability, social justice, and environmental uh, conservation and highlighting how we need to mitigate the impacts and therefore uh, and only then can we actually build back better and not go back to business as usual. Thank you once again. Our next speaker is Dr. Elena Proden, Senior Specialist, uh, Strategic Implementation of Agenda 2030 Unit, Division for Satellite Analysis and Applied Research at UNITAR. Dr. Proden, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Um, I will be sharing my presentation just a second. Sure. Thank you. So, 
I hope it's well visible. Um, and um, um, I would like to start by saying uh, first that um, that um, I guess um, as all, all, all our lives have been affected by the SDGs, also the work that we've been doing and more specifically our uh, institute, which is really um, uh, specialized in training and has its um, like main priority in the area of building capacities uh, of various stakeholders, governments, but also civil society, private sector, etc., in UN member states, in um, what we focus on and the way we, we are doing things as well. And um, uh, I was planning to uh, sort of uh, talk a little bit about um, uh, what work we are doing uh, to support the implementation of the SDGs, why it's important, and uh, what kind of lessons also we've learned uh, from COVID-19. And um, I was also very happy um, to see that my colleague from UNDESA actually covered some of the questions that uh, UK Kashan also addressed to me. And then my presentation will be actually quite uh, complimentary. So I will not be focusing so much on, uh, on uh, the specific SDGs and she's done a much greater job, a better job than I would have done on this. Uh, so let me um, first uh, say perhaps um, uh, specifically in our unit, uh, we, our main objective is to support um, uh, the implementation approach to the 2030 agenda that emphasizes its indivisible and integrated nature. Uh, what we do is that basically we offer knowledge and learning products and services that enable countries and organizations to align their strategies and policies with the SDGs and design and implement evidence-based decisions. Uh, but we don't work only with uh, the organizations and um, countries, we also work with individuals. Uh, since learning is uh, also the business of everyone, uh, we reach out to individuals at different levels, um, either through e-learning offer, and I will talk a little bit about this later, uh, through massive open online courses, uh, where we really build individual capacities no matter where the person or individual is coming from. Uh, or we also reach out uh, to them through a tailored offer um, whereby there is a specific um, uh, demand from organizations or countries. Um, and this is really, training is the main mandate of the United Nations Institute for Training and Research. And we've been focusing uh, more specifically on mainstreaming uh, the SDGs, support, providing support in mainstreaming the SDGs in, in strategic planning and supporting monitoring and evaluation at country level. Uh, and at the same time, uh, ensuring or supporting countries in developing uh, integrated approaches to this mainstreaming process. Uh, then we've been also working quite actively um, on strengthening the capacities uh, of um, countries in, in enhancing stakeholder engagement um, in processes related to the review of progress on the SDGs, but also mainstreaming the SDGs international frameworks. And uh, uh, we also have uh, um, an important uh, um, sort of portfolio that is related to supporting and strengthening uh, statistical capacities and um, um, other aspects related to data production and use uh, for achieving the SDGs. <clears throat> and so in terms of the lessons, first I would like to say a few words about uh, systems thinking. I guess uh, one may say that uh, COVID-19 has become uh, the biggest lesson learned, perhaps one of the largest lessons learned, uh, um, on the importance of systems thinking. Uh, we've been using it already um, in our trainings um, as a conceptual basis uh, for um, um, uh, underlying basically um, uh, the approaches in the area of strategic planning uh, to developing integrated policies, strategies, and programs. Um, 
So perhaps just to, to say a few words and I will illustrate what exactly I mean by using uh, a few slides from our joint training uh, package that we developed uh, together with uh, several other partners, including uh, UN Department of Economic and Social Affairs, the same division as, um, as our colleague is coming from, um, and um, also division of uh, public institutions, but also um, Economic um, Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean. And uh, uh, perhaps uh, one of the pictures that uh, illustrates very nicely what system thinking is about and why it's important for us, um, it's this picture that shows um, that actually the role of system thinking is to help us uh, anticipate unexpected outcomes. Here you can see that, for example, um, like in a situation of a fire, um, uh, there is a, a team of uh, firemen who are trying to catch a lady uh, jumping from a building on fire, but they have not anticipated um, really um, uh, the, res the resonating nature of their um, jumping sheet and the lady gets into fire again. Um, and uh, I think it says a lot about uh, how it important it is when we develop uh, a policy response uh, to try to think not only about what we think it will help us to achieve, but also to try to think what kind of unexpected uh, effects uh, it may involve. Um, and it also means that uh, we are sort of uh, trying to move away from the linear uh, thinking, whereas we think in terms of, uh, okay, how uh, how has uh, the event D been provoked? Uh, it was, it comes from event C and which in turn comes from events A and B. Rather, we need to, to think in loops, feedback loops. And sometimes one event uh, may be affected uh, by another event, event, like for example, you can see here event D by event C, which in turn may be affected by event B, but in different ways. Um, with various feedback loops and then in turn the sort of our final event D can also affect our initial or will affect our initial situation A. Uh, and that's a little bit that the idea that um, uh, seems to be quite important uh, when we talk about the SDGs and uh, how we plan to achieve them uh, by the year uh, 2030. Here I'm just providing an example of a traditional uh, linear problem, problem tree analysis that is being uh, quite often used in strategic planning. And the problem of this analysis is, uh, of course, it's a useful tool, but it sort of um, uh, loses out, it doesn't take into account these various feedback loops between various sectors, but also at, at different periods of time. Um, and here you can see the example sort of, of what kind of um, different type of map you can come up with if you use the systems thinking. Uh, this map is, is based on an actual um, case study that was done by our colleagues with UNDESA, uh, from UNDESA with whom we developed and the training toolkit uh, promoting this methodology. So you can see that actually not only it shows um, that uh, there are various feedback loops, but that also various sectors are connected in different ways. Um, then um, perhaps, oh, why did I say that uh, it was perhaps the world's largest lesson, COVID, uh, uh, from the point of view of systems thinking? Uh, it's because, I guess, and this word was also mentioned by the minister a couple of times, um, it's the whole uncertainty through which we all, but also decision makers, uh, more specifically uh, in the governments, had to go through uh, and with which they had to deal. And system thinking is particularly useful uh, in dealing with this uncertainty. It's really recognizing that we cannot be mastering absolutely everything, but we need to be able to learn to anticipate and build um, our systems in a more resilient way. Um, and I guess also um, uh, what has become also quite clear that uh, a number of decisions had to be taken very quickly um, and uh, many of these decisions um, uh, would have had 
uh, some effects um, at the short term, but also then at the medium term and then in the long term. Um, and also some of them were about really managing trade-offs, which I guess was quite obvious uh, with the COVID and remains quite obvious. Uh, while the crisis started um, as a public health uh, problem, it has immediately spread or affected many other areas uh, with the introduction of travel restrictions, um, closing of borders and social distancing measures. Um, and um, in some ways, um, perhaps uh, when it comes to the uh, um, economic act activity, obviously, um, uh, a number of industries had to close down and um, transport use has decreased uh, considerably. So there were um, uh, negative economic replications, but at the same time, uh, the first, um, initially we've seen um, uh, some positive also environmental um, uh, effects. Uh, what it, when it comes, for example, obviously to the um, 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 decrease in greenhouse uh, gas emissions, um, and um, unprecedented decrease. And as our colleague, uh, previous speaker just mentioned, obviously the, uh, this is something that is happening now, uh, but this is a temporary, uh, temporary uh, phenomenon. So all will depend on how exactly we'll be rebuilding um, uh, our um, economic systems uh, back. Um, then uh, there has been, there have been also dramatic reductions in certain areas in air pollution, in noise pollution. However, uh, there have been also uh, quite fast some negative environmental impacts as well. Uh, when it comes, for example, to uh, growing waste, uh, both organic and non-organic, uh, from medical waste to personal protective equipment, uh, but then also waste um, related, for example, to take away food industry um, and um, actually a reversal on some of the advancements made, for example, in sustainable waste uh, management and recycling. Uh, so there were a number of uh, things that um, uh, in the environmental area, uh, we've been seeing actually uh, different types of effects. Um, also, um, uh, I guess, um, as mentioned already by our colleague, um, one of the unexpected effects of, uh, of the lockdown was uh, also reported um, um, uh, reported increase in domestic violence, for example, that was an unexpected effect, I guess, uh, initially when the lockdown decision has been taken. Uh, then um, also it has been mentioned that, um, and um, WTO specifically have issued a note uh, on the impact of, uh, of the uh, COVID measures related to, uh, um, on the uh, least developed countries, in particular, um, uh, decreasing demand in key um, global markets, uh, declining commodity prices, uh, and also declining remittances, um, and um, how, um, how harsh actually um, uh, the impact may be for LDCs depending on um, export earnings. Um, We've talked uh, I already about, uh, obviously, um, the first area, um, income security, but also food security, etc. So there was a range of impacts across different areas, and many of them uh, have been sort of interconnected in different ways with different uh, feedback loops. Um, so I, I guess the, uh, here the point uh, that, um, that is important to make is system thinking is also, help, is also there to help us rebuild in a way that we can build more resilient societies addressing um, uh, all key dimensions of sustainable development and helping to ensure that we can achieve greatest um, impact across all SDG areas. Uh, then the other thing that uh, sort of has um, um, the other lesson that we've learned was related uh, uh, to the area um, uh, of data uh, and data analysis, how real-time data and analysis um, uh, have become uh, important. Um, we are doing some work in this area and in particular, I guess another aspect that uh, uh, was very interesting was that uh, 
um, as a member of Global Network of Statistical Training Institutes, uh, we also work on data literacy uh, of decision makers, but also citizens at large. Uh, and COVID has demonstrated how also um, the correct uh, use and interpretation of data are really important uh, to the way policies are being designed uh, and what kind of decisions uh, are being taken. Um, and then the last one uh, I'll, uh, I wanted to mention is directly related to, uh, to our main activity. Uh, it's how we deliver our training and learning. Uh, we've seen uh, an unprecedented surge of interest uh, in online learning. Uh, and we've been conducting a survey also with the um, group of more than 50 partners of UNSDG Learn. Uh, it is an online gateway initiative uh, for which our institution, but also another UN sister agency provides secretariat. And the uh, members of this group, uh, more than 50 uh, members, they've uh, indicated around 50% increase uh, in uh, interest in adult online learning. Um, and uh, to conclude, I just wanted to uh, sort of show some of the resources that um, are available um, to everyone interested and uh, uh, that, can, that are basically there to support the implementation of the SDGs, building individual capacities. Um, you can see here, for example, uh, there are toolkits uh, which focus on uh, um, supporting this integrated uh, approach and promoting policy coherence for the SDGs, but there are also a number of free courses. Um, the course, for example, uh, aiming to raise data literacy uh, for the SDGs with uh, a lot of examples related to the SDGs uh, and SDG policies, data governance for the SDGs course, uh, an introductory course to the 2030 agenda, and uh, the course on stakeholder engagement for the SDGs that we deliver uh, together with UNDESA. Most of these courses are done in partnerships. And the last thing I wanted to show, it's uh, UNSDG Learn platform. Uh, this is the platform that I mentioned. At, it's, uh, we, we think it's a great resource and we hope it will become better uh, as the number of partners is growing. But a lot of UN partners are also providing access to their learning resources through this platform. So uh, we invite everyone to use it check it out and perhaps you'll find uh, the course on micro learning you've been looking for. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Froden, for sharing with us what, uh, first of all, what UNITAR is doing in order to achieve uh, the SDGs and Agenda 2030. Uh, thank you for also talking about how systems thinking can actually help us to build more resilient societies and how it's uh, you're moving away from linear thinking and towards thinking in terms of feedback loops that really highlights the interconnections amongst all the SDGs and amongst all sectors. So thank you very much. We would now like to invite our next speaker, uh, Ms. Krista Rasmussen, who is the Senior Research Associate of Policy Planning at the United Nations Foundation. Ms. Krista, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for this opportunity and for inviting me to join this wonderful panel. It's been really interesting to hear everyone. You know, listening to the other panelists and a lot of discussions that I've been participating in recently is that there's a common theme running through all these discussions. And that is the central question of saying, who is getting left behind? And it's a crucial question to understand today as we address and recover from the pandemic and also as we're going forward, as we align our efforts to achieve the SDGs. And so as we've heard from the previous speakers, there's a lot of people that are getting left behind today because of the pandemic. You know, as mentioned earlier, it's the 1.6 billion children affected by school closures. It's the millions who miss crucial vaccines because campaigns have been suspended. You know, it's the women around the world who are bearing the greatest burdens during the pandemic, including on unpaid care work. You know, and that, and that they'll be less able to recover from economic shocks. You know, compared to men, women earn less, so they save less. They're less able to hold, or they, they hold less secure jobs and have less access to social protection, which means their capacity to absorb economic shocks is less, as is their ability to recover. You know, who is getting left behind? It's the horrifying surge of domestic violence, as spoken about previously, when people are trapped in quarantine with their abusers. And there's also minority populations. 
And that means in America, where I live, it means our Black, Indigenous, and people of color, where because of systemic racism, they've been excluded from leadership positions, policy, and decision making, which leaves their communities with less access to crucial information and services like healthcare, social protection, and finance. And so today, we are at a moment where the pandemic has really brought all these inequalities, these people who have been left behind and excluded to the forefront. And I really believe it is revealed in the clearest sense where we have, as harsh as this sounds, where we have failed, you know, where we have failed to meet the most basic human needs. These are things like universal health coverage, food security, digital inclusion, access to education. And all of these are central tenants to achieving the SDGs. And it's a hard but very important truth that we could have been better prepared and in a better place for this crisis. You know, five years ago, the world came together to launch the Sustainable Development Goals. All countries around the world made a commitment to build a sustainable, peaceful, inclusive, and just world where no one is left behind. At the start of 2020, we had seen a lot of progress. We had seen new partnerships, innovative solutions, new strong voices like youth movements, standing up and advocating for the future that we all need. But there was still a long way to go and the pandemic has pushed us further behind on a lot of issues. We are now at a pivotal moment where we can shape our recovery to align with the SDGs and put our world on track for 2030. So what does that mean for today? What does this mean for the recovery and for the decade of delivery on the SDGs? And so, I, you're, a lot of these are going to be repeats because I think we all agree on a lot of this, but there are, I think there are four key lessons to learn from the SDGs and from this current moment. And so the first key lesson that I want to highlight is that it is crucial that when we are building back and recovering, we need to build back a better that is both green and equitable at the same time. And so at least in the United States, and it's a little different around the world, but at least in, in the United States, sustainability is often only connected with the idea of climate and the environment. And the thing is, is the SDGs have shown us how much we need to expand our definition beyond just those two. And so a sustainable society is not only green, but it's also one where all children receive a quality education are vaccinated, drink clean water, are protected from violence, and have equal opportunities to thrive. That's a truly sustainable society. And so addressing inequality must be embedded in our sustainable recovery. And then the second key lesson is one that uh, Dr. Proden was so elegantly explaining, and that's the idea of these systems approaches. So the challenges that we're facing right now are extremely interconnected, and our solutions must also be interconnected and approached from an idea of systems thinking. The pandemic has really revealed how crucial certain aspects of the SDGs, like healthcare and social protection, underpin progress across all of our issues. And we've seen these you know, relationships that we didn't realize uh, existed before or maybe weren't as apparent come to the forefront. How our quality of healthcare affects education, jobs, economy, gender equality, food production. And so all of our approaches and our recovery needs to be taken from this systems approach, as Dr. Uh, Dr. Proden was, was speaking about. The third key lesson that I really think we should focus on is that all of our recovery efforts and our efforts to achieve the SDGs need to center and elevate locally driven solutions. So in the first five years of the SDGs, local communities and actors were some of the fastest and most clear examples of progress on the SDGs. And when I mean local communities and actors, I mean cities, I mean youth movements, universities, uh, private sector, civil society, and so today, during the pandemic, local communities are still at the front lines of responding to the pandemic. Some of the greatest examples of leadership and global cooperation is happening at the city and subnational level, even as national level cooperation has often been delayed. You know, for example, in America, Mayor Eric Garcetti of Los Angeles convened a virtual assembly in March. And this was early in the pandemic of 45 mayors from every region of the world to share solutions and advice. And this is at a time when some of the national level cooperation was often being delayed. City governments are also leading the way in building a green and equitable recovery. You know, some different examples, Milan and Paris, for example, announced ambitious plans to restructure roads to encourage walking and cycling. Los Angeles is working on strategies so that the homeless population that was moved to emergency shelters does not return to the streets after the pandemic. So going forward, local actors will be the source of solutions, innovations, and partnerships needed to recover from the pandemic and also to build a more sustainable world. 
And then the fourth key lesson that I really think we need to consider as we are moving through this is that we need to be driven by leaving no one behind. And so what does that mean in practical aspects? One is that we need to design policies and recovery efforts to reach the most vulnerable communities. Another is that we need to understand who is getting left behind. And this has been mentioned multiple times throughout this panel, is that data is so crucial. The pandemic has shown the importance of what we call disaggregated data. This means data that's not just at the national level, but by geography, by gender, by race, by income group, to reveal who is most affected and who bears the greatest burden. Another thing to ensure that we're leaving no one behind is to ensure our leadership um, and those with decision-making power reflect the communities they are trying to reach. And this especially means putting women and girls at the center of recovery, including in leadership and decision-making roles. So in conclusion, I truly believe that together we can build a sustainable, inclusive, peaceful, and just world. And I'm so excited that organizations like yours, the Green Hope Foundation, are standing up and making their voices heard about how important the SDGs are for our future and for today as we work together to recover and build a more sustainable world. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, I think you highlighted some very important points about how the COVID-19 pandemic has exposed the tremendous inequalities and inadequacies of our systems. Uh, but you also talked about how it's important to build back better uh, in terms of the economy, society, and the environment, and how that truly is sustainability, where all three pillars work and grow together in harmony. And uh, I think you also brought up a really important point on how localizing the SDGs is so important and how that is where uh, the work at, at the ground level actually happens. So thank you once again. Our next speaker is Ms. Mira Karunanantan, who is the director of the Blue Planet Project Canada, which is a global initiative by the Council of Canadians working with partners around the world to achieve water justice. Mira, you have the floor. Hi, uh, Kekashan. Thank you for having me, and thanks to the Green uh, Hope Foundation for organizing this panel. Um, so I was asked to talk about the SDGs and our work within the SDGs. The Blue Planet Project, as Kekashan mentioned, works with communities around the world to promote water justice. We work on campaigns to promote public water and sanitation services. Uh, we also work with communities fighting for greater control uh, over water resources. Um, we, within the context of the SDGs, we worked with a network called the NGO Mining Working Group, a network of uh, NGOs and faith-based groups working on the issue of extractive industries and human rights violations of extractive ind industries. Um, many of the communities we work with in Detroit, in Cape Town, South Africa, uh, in Chile were deeply, deeply impacted by the COVID-19 crisis. And um, what the pandemic has taught us, um, I mean, it's nothing new that there are deep inequalities and it's not surprising that those most impacted are those who are at the forefront of those uh, deep inequalities. Um, that we cannot talk about um, pandemics just like we can't talk about environmental crises without talking about race, gender, class, um, and who is left behind, as, uh, as the previous uh, speaker mentioned. Um, we, uh, we have seen how these communities who are fighting the structural violence of poverty and exclusion and oppression have been made much more vulnerable by the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, but these are communities that were already living in a state of crisis. Um, and so this has brought sort of a state of crisis on top of crisis. Um, we're also seeing not only that, uh, that COVID-19 has, that their vulnerability to the illness has deepened, that their ability to um, secure the support needed when they are uh, impacted by the Ill illness is, uh, is, is much, much less, but also that, um, Lockdown has deepened the exclusion of many communities. So working with uh, communities in South Africa who have to be living in informal settlements, who have to deal with the fact that you're living in a shack that does not provide you with the most basic services required to survive. So how does lockdown work in that context? Um, also that lockdown has brought a great militarization of, you know, the enforcement of, of lockdown has deepened militarization in these communities, and that has resulted in greater violence in these communities. Um, 
So, I mean, I just wanted to focus on the question of what can we learn going forward and what kind of world can we build? Um, other panelists talked about building back better. Um, and so just, you know, three elements, and not to say that this is an exhaustive list, but three elements that we would draw from the many decades of work we've been doing on the issue of um, water and sanitation. One, that we need public water and sanitation services for all. Um, if we are talking about a world that is going into deeper poverty um, than it has in 100 years, we are not going to see the investments that are needed in places like informal settlements, in poor rural communities, those investments aren't going to come from the private sector. We already know this from looking at how it's worked for decades in the water and sanitation sector, that the, the investments that were needed in poor countries in Africa did not come from the private sector. Um, and that the public sector delivers, uh, has better capacity because 90% of water and sanitation services are delivered by the public sector, um, that it costs less to deliver um, through the public sector um, because you're not dealing with um, uh, profits for shareholders. So where we've seen remunicipalization happen, where we've seen um, communities take back control of water and sanitation services or local governments take back water and control of water and sanitation services, we've seen them save huge amounts of money um, because they're not having to deal with, um, with private investments and profits to shareholders. Um, and, and this would apply not just to the water and sanitation sector, to, but to other basic um, public services as well. Um, and um, um, Astra from Yundessa also talked about fiscal space for governments. We know that the fiscal space for governments have shrunk over the years because of debt repayment. We saw, we've seen in the, in the 80s and 90s how structural adjustment programs worked when um, the World Bank and other international financial institutions loaned money to countries to develop their economies, they were, uh, they, th that money was lent with specific conditions. And those conditions involved increasing access uh, to, to the private sector, to private investments. It forced governments to divest or prevented governments from expanding um, in, in, in basic public services, including water and sanitation, education, healthcare, and what we're seeing today in terms of the deepened impacts of COVID-19 is the legacy um, of, uh, of that structure of, of, uh, of international um, lending and uh, international debt. So right now we are in a context where countries have, uh, where G20 countries have announced that they're, uh, as donor countries, that they're offering some debt relief, but then we cannot go back um, and ask these countries to repay at high interest rates when their economies have been so deeply impacted. We're going to see greater exclusion and greater systemic violence as a result if we go back to that model. Um, Elena talked about, Elena from Unitar talked about feedback loops. Well, I think there's a strong feedback loop when it comes, there has been a strong feedback loop when it comes to uh, water and sanitation services. In the last 15 years, uh, groups like the, the Transnational Institute, uh, well, specifically the Transnational Institute in Amsterdam and Public Services International Research, Research Unit have documented the hundreds of communities that have taken water back into, into public hands. Uh, water and sanitation services around the world in the global north and south, we've seen over 300 cases in the last 15 years. So that is a strong feedback loop that, or, or that, is a strong, that is strong feedback that we are receiving from communities around the world that water needs to be public and that that is a starting point, not that that solves all problems because we also know that the state can be um, um, uh, deficient in delivering uh, adequate services, but that, that is a starting point for having the kinds of services that, um, that people need, and particularly working class racialized uh, communities. Um, the second lesson, and this is what many of our organizations um, worked to achieve in the SDGs, uh, and I would say that there's still huge tensions and we did not fully achieve that, but to center the implementation of the SDGs around socioeconomic rights. Um, and that there's a strong link between socioeconomic rights and gender justice, that um, the inability to access 
uh, these services, as the previous speaker uh, mentioned, um, has a disproportionate impact on women and, and girls, and this deepens the gender-based uh, violence of women and girls. We, we see this very much um, in the water, sec water and sanitation sector that um, many of, if you look in Detroit, if you look in Cape Town, in um, many parts of Latin America where uh, women have organized to push back against uh, prepaid water meters against uh, privatization of water services where communities have, have organized that women have been in the at the forefront because this impacts their labor it impacts um, their relationship to their communities uh, women when basic services are priced beyond uh, the ability of families to pay this means uh, it means more work more intense work uh, longer working hours for women who have to manage household budgets, who also have to provide water and sanitation services or water services and deal with um, the lack of sanitation services and the lack of access to health care because women are caring for families, for um, elderly people, for sick people in their communities. So if we want to achieve gender justice, we need to center the implementation of the um, SDGs around socioeconomic rights. Um, uh, and then the third um, lesson we've learned is that water must be part of the commons, um, that we cannot have uh, uh, the deepening of the commodification of water that we're seeing around the world. And to explain, um, you know, frontline communities don't just need access, which is, I feel, a, a lot of uh, UN language or even um, human rights language is based around, uh, is, is um, centered around issues of access to, and that is important. Um, but but what communities around the world are fighting for who are at the front lines of these struggles against economic justice is for greater control, for greater um, decision-making power over uh, water and sanitation services and over water resources. Um, we're seeing increasing conflict around access to water due to climate change um, and drought. Uh, we're seeing the, um, the exclusion of small farmers and, and a lot of subsistence farmers who are women are excluded when, um, uh, you know, when there are conflicts uh, between uh, big corporations and communities around access to water. And um, there are many ways in which, and which I won't have time to get into in this presentation, but one model that is being heavily promoted by the World Bank um, is um, and and uh, in particularly in countries of the global south is the idea of market-based resource allocation systems. So basically, um, the idea that we could set up water rights systems through which companies or users can purchase water rights and then sell them. Um, so it's water extraction rights and usage rights. Um, and we've seen the impacts of this model in places like Chile, where it's, where it's been in place for decades. Um, Chile, as we all know, was the great neoliberal um, experiment. Um, and so water resources and water and sanitation services were privatized in Chile more than anywhere else in the world early on. And today we're seeing the impact as Chile deals with, um, many parts of Chile, they're dealing with severe drought. Um, and communities are, small farmers are, are going up against big corporations that have that own water rights in those in those areas we're also seeing that communities have to buy back water at market prices in order to provide water and sanitation services and so uh, this is the wrong model uh, and again sort of a broken feedback loop where uh, you've got international financial institutions heavily promoting this in in many parts of the global south what we need to learn from the Chilean model is that this is this is, uh, this is not the right system. Um, and when we talk about resilient communities, communities cannot become resilient in the face of climate change or in the post-COVID era if governments have signed away their water rights to transnational water companies. Um, we can't have locally driven solutions um, if, when, when water rights don't belong to uh, or are not held in, um, in, in common. Um, uh, when, when countries and communities lose control over uh, decision making about their water. Um, so I mean, I'll conclude there, I, and some of this might sound radical depending on who's listening, um, but I just want to also remind folks that this year was marked not just to me by the COVID-19 crisis, but by hundreds of thousands of young people taking to the streets. Um, and we're seeing the, the, you know, the street protests today around 
Black Lives Matter. I mean, this is the culmination also of decades of organizing around racial justice. Um, and also the you know hundreds of thousands of, of young people who took to the streets around um, climate change. They're not asking us to tweak the system, to fix a little thing here and there. They're asking us to question the system and to, to, to reimagine a better world. Thank you very much, Mira, and thank you for highlighting uh, the inadequacies that still exist in terms of water and sanitation, but also talking about the amazing work that you're doing uh, to address uh, these inequalities in terms of water and sanitation. So thank you once again. Now I would like to invite someone who really needs no introduction. I'd like to invite Mr. Jonathan Granoff, who is an attorney, author, lecturer, and screenwriter. He is the president of the Global Security Institute and chair of the Task Force on Nuclear Nonproliferation of the International Law Section of the American Bar Association. Mr. Granoff, you have the floor. Jonathan, you're on mute. There we go. Thank you very much, Kekishan. Uh, well, I understand why I'm on the panel. There was a, a real issue about gender equity and you really couldn't find a guy. So you just, you know, it was just an, not an issue of competence or anything. It was like, well, we have to find a guy because we have to have balance. So, you know, I don't mind. I don't, you know, I have sensitivity to that sort of thing, but I can overcome it. I, I don't mind just being here because of my gender. Uh, so, so thank you. Um, so I'm in a facetious mood. I had a political mentor, Senator Alan Cranston, and he used to say, when you look at the situation of the world, you have two responses, terror or humor. So uh, I'm looking at the terrible, terrible consequences of a world in which the definition of how we pursue security is based on mythical thinking denying realism and leads us to be on the wrong bus to fulfill SDG number 16, which I will just share with everybody because I think it's really a, a lot, there, are, there are people watching this who are not as in, involved in the, saturated with the SDGs as we are. It, 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 goal 16 of Sustainable Development Goals is dedicated to promotion of a peaceful and inclusive societies for sustainable development, the provision of access to justice for all, and building effective, accountable institutions at all levels. Well, that, that means the rule of law, that means equity, that means the fulfillment of human rights. So when we're talking about water, for example, um, water as a human right means it's the duty of the state to provide it to everybody. But we haven't uh, but we haven't figured out yet how to put that into a legal framework. And presently, human rights are treated in derogation uh, as, as derogatory to property rights. So presently, property rights are winning. Water is largely a commodity when it should be a human right. In other words, it's a duty of the state to provide it if it's a human right. But how absurd is our situation? Last year, the world spent over $560 billion on advertising, convincing people that they need stuff they don't need, or they need to get stuff that they need in ridiculous ways, like flying water from France to the United States, because there's not enough good luxury water in the United States to drink. Now, that, that shows how utterly insane the situation has become. I mean, really, when you think about uh, a trillion dollars spent uh, a decade, uh, you know, uh, on advertising. I mean, just, 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 um, um, you know, just over a trillion, five trillion. Yeah, five trillion a decade on advertising. What, what? Benefit is that giving us? Is advertising informing us on what we need? Is it educating us? So why is this happening? 
what is the model that we have? What are the myths that we have that are blocking us from doing what is so obviously necessary to move to a human security regime? If you look at the SDGs, they are an integrated human security roadmap. That's what they are. They tell us how to move to a secure world in which the natural regenerative processes of nature are honored, in which we honor the climate, in which we honor each other, in which we pursue peace, in which we, in which we pursue the rule of law, in which we put human rights as at least equal to property rights. As an American, I'm reminded of the central theme, the central cancer that begins my nation, which is the distance between all are equal in the Declaration of Independence to the three-fifths compromise in the Constitution, which puts a mass of people as less than full human beings. And then it doesn't get resolved in the Civil War, which is a battle between maximum property rights and minimum human rights. And that doesn't get resolved in law until the civil rights laws of the 1960s. And we can see today that on the streets it hasn't been resolved in fact. So we have a situation in which things are loved and people are used rather than loving people and using things. So the economic model that we have is based on the myth of perpetual growth. And that myth of perpetual growth has run up against the natural regenerative processes of nature. And so we're impacting the climate such that we're literally melting the polar ice cap and the consequence of climate change and the suffering attendant to it is weighed mostly on people of color and people in the so-called developing world, I would say the exploited world. And one of the aspects of the SDGs is based on equity, based on caring for all people. And actually there is an SDG specifically addressing climate. But what is the myth? There's a myth, there's wrong thinking behind it. And we have to attack that wrong thinking. The wrong thinking is basically that we can have an economic system based on creating false needs for perpetual growth. And the natural world is not, not amenable to perpetual growth. The natural world treats us like any other living being and requires us to live in harmony with it. But our economic order is not based on that principle. Our economic order is based on a mythical structure. So the pollution of the environment, the destruction of the environment is not even included in, in general accounting principles. It's an externality. So it's not realistic. I'm arguing for realism, human security and realism. The SDGs are based on realism. The SDGs are all measurable. They're all, uh, they're, they can all be fulfilled using current, current skills in science and technology that we have available now. But we have ideas that are preventing it. Another idea that's very, very adverse to fulfilling the integrated human security agenda of the SDGs is the lack of fulfillment of number 16, accountability at all levels. So the UN Charter, for example, has within it Article, 16, uh, Article 26, which calls for the military staff committees to come together at the instructions of the Security Council to reduce military expending, uh, expenditures and free up resources for social development. Well, that's what we need right now, because military expenditures last year were in excess of $1.9 trillion. That's about $60,000 a second spent on ways of pursuing security by weaponry. And it's reached a burlesque proportion with nuclear weapons, which the, which, which the world will spend a, a, you know, a, a trillion dollars in the next, in the next uh, 10 years on, a trillion dollars. The, the, why it's a burlesque proportions of madness is because the more you perfect the weapon, the less security you obtain. So it's improved means to unimproved ends, because the idea behind it is that power, military power brings security. It's a myth. Military superiority doesn't bring security. It didn't bring security in Vietnam. It's not bringing security in Afghanistan. It's not gonna resolve problems in Kashmir, the Middle East, Syria, et cetera. These are human problems. They don't have military or technical solutions. The other myth is, uh, 
the other myth that the countries with these huge expenditures say is we're pursuing strategic stability. How do you measure strategic stability? Certainly, you can't measure strategic stability in the middle of an arms race. And presently, we're seeing the modernization of weapons of mass destruction as stimulating another arms race. So I think that you can see where the sincerity of states' real values are in the way the budget is structured. The budget is like the skeleton of the body of the state. You can put all kinds of cosmetics on it, but the skeleton tells you how big it is and how fast it can move. And if all the money is spent on a paradigm of fulfilling the first duty of the state, which is to pr provide security for its citizens, is expended on mythical thinking that only exacerbates the problems, the body's gonna go the wrong direction. As Wangari Matai used to say, it's the wrong bus. So you can fix the bus up all you want, but it's going to the wrong direction. The SDGs, on the other hand, are the correct direction. We haven't made the case that the SDGs improve the, to the general public. We haven't made the case that the SDGs improve the quality of daily life on the street for people, that they're actually relevant, that the guardrails contained within, them, within it as principles are necessary for development, and that, and, that, and that I don't know of any major country that has a minister of fulfillment of the SDGs. So there's nobody advocating in the circles of power where, where economic allocations are made that we need to fulfill the SDGs. And that goes, of course, to SDG number 16, accountability. Accountability at all levels of governance. Fulfill the, the UN Charter. The Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty has within it the obligation to negotiate the elimination of nuclear weapons. This is a treaty that's, that's almost universal. The International Court of Justice says, you, has issued a unanimous ruling that the nations with nuclear weapons must negotiate elimination. But nuclear weapons are just a, a focal point of the insane thinking of how security is obtained. So in order to address the elimination of nuclear weapons, you have to have a different paradigm of how security is obtained. And I would propose that the SDGs are exactly a place to begin. The other place to begin is, in, uh, is the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, um, which, which states, in accordance with the preamble of the UN Charter, which places the legitimacy of the UN in the peoples of the world, not the states, the peoples of the world. And the Universal Declaration of Human Rights affirms the immeasurable quality of the dignity of the person. Dignity is not something you can measure. It's a quality, it's not a quantity. But we all know what it is. We know when it's impaired. We know when it's not there. You hear people, you hear some despots say, oh, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is culturally relative. We, I must tell you, you will not find one person who's ever been tortured, who's had their fingernails pulled out and been, and, and been subject to torture and, and, and the consequences of the full deprivation of their human rights saying, oh, human rights are relative. No, they're not. The inherent dignity of every person is not relative. We all know what it is. It means that you put their welfare in the same, in the same category as your own welfare. It means that you make sure that people have decent housing, decent health care, access to water, clean water, access to education, etc. We have yet to even have a country put forward in the General Assembly a proposition that every secondary school child in the world should have a copy of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Um, uh, Madame Ferrier, I was very impressed by the fact that your small country has within the educational system human rights education. I can assure you in my very large and wealthy country that if you ask secondary school kids what are the, what, what's contained in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, you will get a blank stare because it's not in the curriculum. And, and, and it would seem to me it would be pretty easy to get that. I've been pushing for that. Every year there's all these resolutions extolling the virtues of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, but I have yet to see one country put forward the proposition that this should be part of the core curriculum of every secondary school child. So I think it's our task as activists and as civil society actors to push, to take the SDG seriously, to push it into domestic politics, to make it part of the 
political process of advocacy for political office. Because if there's one thing that this virus tells us is our mortality and our vulnerability is equal. It doesn't recognize gender, class, race, religion, high, low, and it doesn't carry a passport. And if, and if, there's, and, and, and if there's any disease anywhere, it can spread everywhere. And last but not least, we're lucky that this is not a bioweapon. In the future, in the future, fewer people with less resources and less money will be able to create havoc, havoc faster than they can now. So we have to create an international regime in which eliminating weapons of mass destruction is part of the normal duty of the state. And right now, right now, we don't even have an inspection regime uh, for, the, for the Biological Weapons Convention. We have, we have regimes of condemnation and, and, and verification and monitoring with chemical weapons and nuclear weapons. And we've seen how effective it, it, it is with chemical. Yes, Syria violated it, but the fact is they weren't a member of the, the, see, the uh, Chemical Weapons Convention, but the United States and Russia came forward and said the use of chemical weapons violates a norm. It's peremptory, it's illegal even if a country doesn't join it because the norm has been established. We have to establish a similar norm for all weapons of mass destruction, and which means strengthening the international judicial system, strengthening the international criminal court, and we need an international human rights court. So um, our tasks are long-term, but, but we've never had this moment of pause. It's like the teacher, you know, the teacher says, you have a timeout, go in the corner and think it through. You've, not, you've been misbehaving. So it's as if the nations and peoples of the world have been told by Mother Nature, hey, in the corner, time out, think it through. So we're seeing the extreme toxicity of nationalism, racism, xenophobia, the ab absurd, uh, the ab absurd uh, focus on, on stimulating the economy from the top down instead of from the bottom up. We're, we're seeing clearly what needs to be done in ways that humanity as a whole has never seen. We're not only reminded that we have an internet that allows us, to, the technology allows us to do this, but I think any serious person is, is, is contemplating their mortality and reflecting on how do I relate to my fellow human beings? How, how, how am I connected in the internet? Because that's what happens when you think about your mortality. You think about how are you connected to the whole? Where am I going afterwards? So this is a time, this is a moment in which the perennial values that make us human have to come into the forefront of a human security agenda. The SDGs relate mainly to the externalities of security. But if we're going to have human security, you have to affirm the fullness of the human being. And human beings are, need meaning in their lives. We all need meaning. We all need to, to believe that we're moral creatures. That's what it is to be human. So you can believe that you have love, but I have love for my country, I have love for my race, I have love for my race, I have love for my gender, I have love for something limited. But that's not the kind of love that we have to advance. We need to have a love that's universal, a love that is at least as wise as the virus, that it's borderless, a love that the kind of love that's put in every infant that's universal, that we come with. And the ethics that arise from that quality of love that makes us human, that makes us not just an animal that eats, sleeps, defecates, and dies, but provides meaning and choice is embodied in the golden rule. It's universal. It's in every religious and wise tradition of the planet, without, almost without exception, throughout all time. But we haven't applied it to the nations of the world. We haven't seen any nation say, as a matter of humanity, we must treat other nations as we want to be treated. And that's essentially what the premise is of the SDGs. And that's the premise in this conversation, leave no one behind. That's the premise that Jesus said, I was the least amongst you, what you do to the least amongst you, you do to me. And it's the premise of political philosophy that Mahatma Gandhi said, whenever there's a policy before you, and you want to know whether it's a good idea or a bad idea, imagine the face of the most disenfranchised person you've ever seen and think, does this policy benefit or burden them? If we take these kind of basic principles as our guideposts, it'll help us guide 
you know, it'll help us as, as spokespeople of these causes to guide the larger humanity in the post-COVID world. And one last thing, um, our adversaries in this, the people who believe in some of these myths, at least in the United States, and I saw that this has happened through the evangelical alliances in Latin America and other countries where elections have been dramatically distorted, vote on the issue of abortion. Well, abortions, obviously nobody's for abortion. It's a morally compromised action. It's, it's a tragedy. It's not some great thing. The issue is whether the state should intervene and when. But I'm not going there. What I'm going to is that people who are adamantly against abortion, oddly enough, are also for more military expenditures, less money for schools, more money for government intrusion into your civil liberties, less constraint on business, less constraint on protecting the environment, now, these, these issues, and that's how they vote. Now, these issues are not necessarily interconnected. These are alliances that are artificial. They're like astroturfing demonstrations, which is what, you know, what the Tea Party did, did in America, a handful of billionaires creating this movement. But we have natural allies, people who care about human rights, care about disarmament. People who care about disarmament care about climate. People who care about climate care about gender equity. People who care about gender equity care about education. We are natural allies, but we haven't come together around organizing principles so that we coordinate our efforts and sing as one voice. We have oarsmen all pulling in the same direction, but we're not in sync. And I think that the, the principle that we can move in that direction is pursuing human security rather than just the security of states. Human security to me is the, is the framework if we include the human being as a moral, loving, compassionate creature, as a holistic approach. So the SDGs are a huge step forward in human development. It's a huge step forward where the world has said, this is what we ought to do. And never ever think that an ought is just a weak, idealistic nothing. The entire world changed when Thomas Jefferson, who didn't, wasn't able to fully live up to this, put forward a vision beyond his own grasp. He said, all men are created equal. Well, when he said it, you, had a, you, you weren't equal if you didn't have property. You weren't equal if you were a person of color. And it didn't even include women. But the, but the meaning behind it has expanded to say all human beings, women, homeless, wealthy, are equal. And that's been the magnet of social change ever since. It was the magnet that created the whole principle of democracy and governments, accountability of government, being accountable to those whom they govern. That's where it came from. So that an idea, a true idea that resonates in the hearts of humanity can be a huge, a huge power for social change. It's more powerful than all the money of the billionaires holding us back. It's more powerful than the armies because it comes from the heart. And I think the principle that we have to address human security in its fullness is that kind of principle. And that's what the SDGs are essentially about. And I am really honored to be with a group of people who are devoting their time, their energy, their lives to advancing what's good and virtuous that makes us human, which is loving kindness and compassion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jonathan. It's always such a pleasure to listen to you. And I think yeah, you. Uh, there's one very important thing that I picked up from your presentation is that the importance of loving people and using things instead of using people and loving things. And I think that is so important, especially when we're talking about empathy and compassion. And you know, someone once told me that you must be really brave to be on the same panel as so many women. So you truly are. And also we invited you because of your knowledge and expertise. I, I'm, I, by the way, um, I was in the first male class at Vassar College. So I, I was thoroughly indoctrinated with feminism. Like, like it was in the 1960s. So it was fanatics. So I'm, I'm completely comfortable. <laughs> but really, I mean, I mean, this is a time and I was joking, of course. I was totally joking, you know. But but we haven't gotten there. I mean, you know, we haven't really gotten there. We're not in a, we're not in a, I, I recognize that we're not in a world of gender equity. In this international community that we're in of people who are thinking, you know, thinking above the, above the fray of the crisis du jour, yes. 
but, uh, but in jobs and in the street. And the fact is that in the conflicts of the world, women and children are the most damaged. You know, in World War I, it was, uh, I, think, I think it was 10% of the victims were civilians and very few women. And in the wars that have gone on in the last decades, it's something like 80, 90% of the victims are innocent civilians, mainly, mainly women, children, and the elderly. That's who suffers from these conflicts. And, uh, uh, you know, the whole UN system is set up to prevent the scourge of war. And nothing could do more to prevent the scourge of war than a actual money on the line to fulfill the SDGs. That would do more, you know, move. So one of the programs of the organization I'm the president of is called Move the Nuclear Money. It came out of uh, Parliamentarians for Nuclear Nonproliferation and Disarmament. And uh, the idea is that we've got to move a portion of the money that's set up for destruction and move it to fulfill the SDGs. Pretty straightforward. Move the money. That is actually really, really great. And thank you so much for sharing that with us. And, you know, wow, we just had such an amazing and informative discussion right now. And thank you so much to all of our panelists. And now I think I have to open the floor for questions because I can see that there are many people who've raised their hands. Due to time constraints, I think we can only take one or two, but I would request our panelists, uh, if we send you the questions, uh, if that's okay, if you can answer uh, them by email. But I will take a few questions uh, right now. Our first question is uh, from Mayanka Domini. So I will be promoting you to a panelist. We should be seeing Mayanka, yes. Mayanka, can you hear us? Yes. Yes, your floor is yours. Thank you, panelists, for a wonderful discussion. My name is Mayanka from Suriname. My question is for Dr. Elena. What needs to be done, especially in developing nations, to overcome the data gaps with regards to women and girls? For example, an unequal impact of COVID on women and girls. And how can we improve resilience using this knowledge? Thank, thank you. you. Uh, thank you, Mayanka. Uh, Dr. Elena? Uh, you're, yes, you're muted now. Um, so if I understood correctly, the first question was about how to improve the availability of data, and the second was about the use of data. Uh, improving the availability of data, I think one of our colleagues uh, mentioned when it comes to women and girls, perhaps on topics that are um, uh, sort of of general nature, um, one of the key messages of the SDGs is that disaggregated data would be really important. So understanding specifically in a cross-cutting way the situation of uh, women and girls. Uh, and for this purpose, obviously, um, whenever data are being collected, it's important that it's possible to sort of disaggregate and identify the specific trends. Uh, for men and women, for, for, for girls specifically. Um, then, um, then it will depend, uh, I guess, on the area. Well, in general, I think uh, um, 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 sex-related disaggregation is available in many household services. Uh, and um, perhaps the related, uh, actually quite often the starting point should be rather um, what are sort of the problems and uh, what are the policy issues that need to be addressed uh, so that the right questions can be asked uh, in the questionnaires. Uh, I think that's sort of uh, a very important um, thing that, uh, that really needs to be addressed. And also from the work that we've been doing with some of the uh, uh, countries, um, in particular last year worked a lot with small island developing states, 
is that I think one of the things that uh, they are trying to improve now, we worked on do data user, data producer uh, dialogue, is that uh, actually there is a better understanding between, um, on the one hand, data users, decision makers, what kind of data, what kind of things or nature or problem they, they are trying to understand, then the data uh, producers to understand what kind of questions need to be done, what kind of data needs to be collected. And then at the same time, uh, and this is what I mentioned also, what uh, we are trying to improve, it's to strengthen the capacity then of decision makers to correctly interpret uh, and use this data uh, when policies are being developed. So I guess it's, it's a bit sort of a more general question. I think in every specific context, uh, it will probably be different. Uh, but um, data use, I think one of the things that we are trying to do is really on the one hand for decision makers to improve statistical literacy, but in a very applied manner. So for example, we, we provide examples of policy and specific cases um, uh, how, on how exactly data and evidence uh, can, fun, can help inform policy design, but also evaluation, policy evaluation. And on the other hand, also, um, I think that's also one of the gaps that is being recognized by many national statistical offices. It's how do we communicate effectively on data? And also communicating data is also one of the things that we are trying to, um, to address in our learning materials. And our materials are free, as I mentioned, uh, they are available on, on the websites. Uh, so whoever is interested in taking these courses, please feel free to, to register and take them. Thank you so much, Dr. Prodin. Very much. Thank you so much, Mayanka. I will now take well one more question uh, from our audience. Uh, that will be, I will now ask Pragna Vasupal. I uh, will be promoting you to a panelist. Uh, we can't hear you, Pragna. We we still can't hear you. Uh, we can see you though, just not hear you. Would you be okay to type your, uh, send in your question and then we'll be able to send your question in to our panelists. Thank you very much. And again, technical difficulties. So our last question is from Joshua Saji. I really hope this does work. Hello, Joshua, can you hear us? Hello, am I audible? Yes, you're audible and visible, great. Uh, hi, um, thank you all for such inspiring insights. Um, my question is to Mr. Granoff. Uh, what can be done uh, to make peace building more inclusive for young people and they would be able to play a greater role in? Thank you, Joshua. Uh, Jonathan? Well, peace building is, uh, peace building, there's, I mean, there's different technical definitions of it. Some, you know, for to some extent, it means you know, re, re, building society after conflict. Some of us think it's like an ongoing activity. So I wondered, I, I wondered how you were, how you were approaching it. Was it building peace? Because peace is more than just the absence of war. Peace in a society is justice in your daily lives. It's it's a sense of well-being in your community and security in your daily life. Decent food, decent housing, decent clothes, de decent healthcare, and social justice. These are aspects. These are part of the and, and, and these are part of the fabric of, of peace. And building that kind of peace, that's a lifelong endeavor. Then there's the other side of the other technical definition of building peace in a zone of conflict. So I was wondering how you were thinking of it, because otherwise it's too broad a question. From the broadest sense, from the broadest sense, I'm perfectly happy to get up, you know, thirty thousand feet and answer it in the larger sense of how you become an instrument of peace building. But what did you mean by that? Um, my question was more related to how can peace or the idea of peace be instilled to the, the younger 
generation and how they can take this forward with other communities. Uh -huh. So you're talking about peace building at the very fabric of, of, of society itself. Okay. Yes. I mean, for example, a woman could ask it and then you would go to resolution 1325 of the Security Council of the United Nations, which talks about women in peace building in a very specific technical way. You're talking about it in how do we build peaceful societies? So there are a lot, there are some countries that actually have terrific educational programs starting in, in the youngest grades to teach skills of conflict resolution and tolerance and understanding. New Zealand is a model for doing that. So New Zealand, because of that, I would say, has a very low uh, crime rate. And it's made enormous progress in integrating its indigenous peoples into the uh, into a healthy society without impairing their traditions. And because I think because there is a, a, a fundamental understanding that the values you put in children are going to be the expression in their later lives. So I think it has to begin in the... the, the using these skills of, in the United States, for example, men, males, from a very young age are taught a very violent competitive ethic. I mean, the kind of football we play, for example, is almost a military sport. It like prepares you for aggression, it prepares you for organized violence, and it prepares you for an adversarial world. I win, you lose. As distinguished from many other sports that are not quite as violent or are much more uh, uh, Another, an example of a sport not like that in our, in, our, in our daily lives here is basketball. A pickup basketball court is a very, very influential social, uh, social experience uh, for many, many young Americans. In pickup basketball, you go and you keep switching sides. You play hard, but the guys you were playing against will be on your team in 15 minutes. So it's like a celebration of contained aggression and fun. And you talk trash. So you learn enormous conflict resolution and tolerance skills. Like you get the ball and people talk trash to you. You know, like I'm kind of short and he's like, hey, shorty, I'm gonna put it in your face. And that's legitimate to do that. So it's a wonderful, wonderful game like that. And I think soccer's like that. So you see actual, um, actual sports being used in all over the world to build peace and understanding amongst, amongst people. But I think it really goes to, to making that part of the focus of core curriculum in education, is teaching children cooperative and conflict, uh, conflict resolution skills. Last but not least, one of my sons, uh, I have three sons, and one of them was, uh, was, went to the dean of a very prestigious American university and said, the entire grading system is, is, is distorted. He said, in most jobs, whether you're in a law firm, because the kind of school that teaches people to be in high level professions or in a team in a high tech company, you work in teams. And the social skills of, of working together are really important. And in my classes, we work in teams, we share information. We, the greatest learning experiences we have is working together. And yet we're graded in a completely competitive fashion. So you have two completely contradictory processes going on. The skills that will make us successful in business and building teams are completely minimized in deference to creating a singular competitive ethic where we're only out for ourselves. That doesn't make any sense to me. I agree with my son. So when I taught law in, in, uh, in, in a, I taught an international law at a university, I wouldn't grade on a bell curve, you know, a bell curve where you have some certain, goes like this and certain number fail and certain number exceed. I said to the Dean, I'm not gonna do that. No one's gonna be on the failure side. They're gonna have to leave the class because if they can't do it right, they're gonna have to keep writing the papers until they get it right. They're gonna have to be making the arguments until they get it right or they're not leaving my class or I'm gonna throw them out of the school because people's lives, liberty and property are gonna be in their hands when they become lawyers. And I don't want any D-level lawyer coming out of my class. They're all going to be competent. And, they're, and I'm not doing an bell curve. Everybody's got to succeed. And uh, I mean, it was interesting to me is the dean said, no one else has ever made that argument. I said, so what? So what? 
Slavery was allowed for hundreds of years. I'm making the argument and I'll make it publicly if you want to go public with it. Because what you're essentially saying is you're going to graduate people who are incompetent. And I, you know, who are going to be in the bottom of the bell curve. And I don't want anybody on the bottom of my bell curve. And I, I, I have to tell you, I prevailed in the argument. I, but I think other professors who have a different attitude, they liked, they liked the power of, you know, you're fired, you know, like Donald Trump and his TV show. They like that power. Um, so anyway, I think it comes down to, uh, to, uh, to early, to the educational institutions to teach the skills of self-restraint, diligence, tolerance, compassion, caring, cooperation, these basic human skills, which are often marginalized. And in the United States system, because of the way our public schools are financed, which is locally through property taxes, in our cities, kids don't really get an education, they get warehoused. You can't teach 45 kids when half of them didn't have breakfast and they live in overcrowded conditions. So they're just warehoused. And there's no effort whatsoever to teach them the human skills that they need to really fully develop. So if you're thinking of going into education, I couldn't think of anything more valuable than to look at some of the best practices on this, on this score. And I think New Zealand is the best example. Are you in India? Uh, no, I'm from Dubai. Oh, okay. Only because in India, there's a school in Lucknow, the Montessori School in Lucknow, which is one of the largest schools in India. That's an example of what I'm talking about. I mean, I think they have 40,000 students and I've been there and I've lectured there and it blew my mind the extent to which the Hindu kids had to learn Islam, the Islamic kids had to learn Hinduism, oh. the, the Islamic kids had to learn Zoroastrian, everybody, they had to learn Christianity, and they had to, they had to learn as part of their curriculum how to appreciate the other, whatever the other was. And I'd never, I'd never seen such enthusiastic high school kids with such positive energy anywhere else. So, I mean, it's doable. Thank you so much, Jonathan, and thank you so much, Joshua. Also, I'd just like to mention it's a really small world because Green Hope Foundation just conducted a workshop for World Environment Day at the Montessori School in Lucknow. So it's a real- Oh, stop, really? Yes, really, for just World Environment Day last two weeks ago. So That's yeah, beautiful. it's a very, very small world. So uh, thank you so much, Jonathan, for mentioning that, and thank you, Joshua, for your uh, question. Uh, Minister Ferrier, we actually did have uh, Pragna, who came on to the call, did actually have a question uh, for you, which was about uh, the most challenging aspect of uh, COVID-19 that uh, Suriname faced and what was the step taken to address that. So if you could uh, answer that for us, that would be really, really great. Uh, you're on mute. Can you please repeat the question, the most challenging, and then? Sure, what was the most challenging aspect of the COVID pandemic that Suriname had to face? And what were, what were the steps that were taken to address that? Okay. We're still in the midst of the pandemic because we're now going up to the, the top in the crisis. So, but the most challenging is, again the, the starting the distance education especially for the most for that those are the children in the districts um who don't even use our national language which is uh, our, our official language which is dutch but at home more than 70 percent of the children speak their own languages so it's what we're doing now is uh, we have those tablets and we will put on the lessons in videos in our official language in school, but then also the teacher can um, translate those for in their traditional language, whether it's trio or Karib or Sarabakan. That has to do with the location. And that is the most, uh, the biggest to reach the children and to really know what is going on there in the community. I have communities uh, where the children never went to school. 
and in the, in the border region. So, and we have children who go to school, they cross the river, they go to school in French Guyana, they speak French. And then they come back later in the day and they, they, they speak their own traditional language, but not, no Dutch. And now here with the COVID, everything, all the communication was at the, in the first stage was in Dutch and very difficult Dutch. So the children do not understand. So again, the challenge is reaching those children and indeed fill in no child left behind. And looking at ways to, to keep them safe, now again with the flooding situation, and keep their families um, healthy. Because the, now the virus is really spreading at a very high rate. Every day you have a new number of death, which we didn't have uh, before. Also, the military situation is very... Uh, yeah, tragic because we have to deal with uh, the illegal um, the people who come from Brazil looking for gold and things like that. And they spread, they're spreading the, the virus. So the community thing is, again, with, with, as far as health is concerned, it's a very big issue indeed. Thank you so and much. It was lovely to meet in Mr. Uh, Jonathan because uh, stressing the human rights, that is also my area. Really, that's very, very important. Also for the educational system. It should be, again, subject in every school. And I always tell the people, the Human Rights uh, Convention and the children, uh, the, the, the Convention on Rights and the you should know them not by letter, but you should you should feel the spirit. What is it meant? Why is it stated like that? And when you understand them, then you go whether you're a teacher or a parent or uh, whatever duty bearer, right? you're a politician or, or uh, you go with the right mindset. And that I think that is failing when we're talking about human rights or. or that is failing the right mindset. It's a question when you want to succeed, it has to do with prioritizing human rights and not economy or power or things like that. Thank you. So it was really a pleasure meeting you again and meeting my other panelists from Serena. I'd like to send you a proposed GA resolution on the subject that maybe you could bring to your permanent rep to see if we could get a general assembly resolution, putting some tangible advancement of education on, on, there's a lot of organizations doing human rights education, but there was a woman, Anna Cataldi, an extremely courageous uh, photographer journalist who stayed in Sarajevo during the siege and took all those pictures that told the story and she became a UN messenger of peace and raised $3 million and produced a million and a half little passports of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. But she did this 17 years ago before 70% of the kids have electronic access. So now you could have every secondary school kid, almost every, not every, but a, a large number of secondary school kids have the Universal Declaration of Human Rights as part of their curriculum by electronically so it's time to make put some something tangible into a ga resolution advancing human rights education so after this i'll send you the drafts and see if you can get your small country to make a because i think that if one country stepped forward a lot would join and you're doing it the reason you have the credibility the reason that you could do it is you're doing it already so you have credibility. Awesome. Thank you. Thank so you. Much. Thank, you. Thank you so much. And uh, we have time for one line from each panelist for concluding remarks. I'd like to start in reverse order. So Jonathan, you can go first. One line as a concluding remark. Love people, use things. Don't love things and use people.
and understand what are things that we create, governments, schools, religions, races, and what are the things that are given to us by the creator? That's our humanity. So love that humanity within all humanity and use things. Never love things and use humanity. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Dr. Elena? I would just like to say that it has been a pleasure to be participating in this panel. And uh, although I didn't speak much about human rights, but for sure they are the basis of the SDGs. Uh, we talk always about a human rights-based agenda, so it's extremely important. Thank you so much. And maybe last, one last thing I would like to mention is that I had the pleasure actually of visiting Suriname two years ago at the invitation of the chief statistician. Uh, so it was uh, really great. I, uh, it was great experience. And I was particularly struck by how uh, multi-ethnic the country is and how the society lives together. It's, it's actually, it was quite impressive. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Elena. We've had the exact same uh, wonderful experience in Suriname. So on that note, I'd uh, like uh, Her Excellency to please give her concluding remarks. My concluding words are that we as humans start thinking about the responsibility we have towards each other and towards our environment. And that we take up that responsibility and help restoring the world. Like we see now the, the, the consequences of the COVID that uh, how, the, how nature is getting back together in their original way. And you can see that in Suriname, but you can see that also in other parts. So, it's a sign, I think, from God that the responsibility we have to look after nature and we should pick it up in love. Thank you. Thank you so much, Your Excellency. And, uh, you know, the challenges that are confronting us are daunting, but they are not insurmountable. And we must ensure that we pool our resources and our wisdom cutting across all social and political barriers so as to accelerate the recovery process that is humane, that is just, sustainable, and equitable. And for that, we need transparency, we need collaboration and multilateralism. And we need cross-cutting engagement that is both lateral and vertical, so that no one is left behind. And only then can we come out stronger and build back better. So with this, I would like to uh, conclude Green Hope's virtual SDG Summit, but our conversation has just begun. We shall e-meet you again very soon to carry forward this discussion and advocacy. So please stay safe and have a wonderful weekend. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you for bringing us together. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye-bye.